Hi, welcome to this lecture on designing the study. My name is Jeff Carver. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Alabama, and I'm going to be walking you through some of the basic details that will be helpful as you think about how to design a study to address your research question. I want to start with some basics about empirical studies and what they are and what they aren't. Um, so as a starting point, the term empirical just simply means based on observation. So when we talk about doing empirical studies, we're talking about doing studies where we're going to gather information, observations of our study participants, and try to draw some conclusions based on those. The idea of an empirical study is commonly but wrongly understood to mean a controlled experiment using a lot of quantitative data. This, of course, is one type of an empirical study, but it's not the only type. There are many other ones that you can use that will be relevant in your context. Mary Shaw, who is well known in the software engineering world, differentiated these empirical techniques that are based on observations from other approaches that people can use to validate results. For example, persuasion, implementation, or analysis. So empirical studies sit along these other ones as ways that you can test out and evaluate hypotheses and other uh, results from your studies. So before I talk about what they are, I want to give you a few misconceptions to clear up some of the things that people misunderstand about empirical studies. So the first misunderstanding is that an empirical study is something you do one time and you move on. But in reality, empirical studies are not one-shot deals. They're things that we need to run and rerun and replicate and try in different situations so that we can have a better understanding of what's going on. So we take the basic premise that computer science education is really a laboratory science. And what we mean by that is that you use something more like the scientific method, where you observe what's going on in your classroom or in your discipline, you make some reflections about that, you build some models about what's going on, and then you test them out through experimentation, and then you iterate. So these are not one-shot deals because we have to follow this scientific method and the scientific process over and over again to get a deeper understanding of what's really going on. Another misconception is what is the overall purpose of an empirical study? So following what I just said about replication, the overall purpose of a study is not to get a yes or a no, up or down certification of a technique. Um, rather, what we're really trying to do is get answers and insights into what's going on. So do we need to modify the technique? Do we need to evolve it? Or is there an environment where it works better or where it works uh, less well? How do we figure those different things out? So for example, if we might make a statement like we ran a study of pedagogical technique X and now we know that it doesn't work, well, that's not really the kind of result we're looking for. More reasonably, we're trying to see, well, pedagogical technique X performed worse or better than pedagogical technique Y in our environment. That's the kind of result we might get out of a study. But what that then uh, presupposes that we've defined environment, and so that includes the people, who's going to be in your study, and what their expertise, their goals, their knowledge, et cetera. Uh, and it also implies that if we're going to say better or worse, we have some decision on how we're going to measure better or worse. What is a metric that is an indicator of performance? So we've had to define those things um, early on. And the last thing about this misconception is that it, we should not assume that there's a solution that's going to work best in, in every case. So no solution is really expected to be better for all people, all students, under all conditions. Okay, so let's move on to some of the common uh, background information we need to know about studies before we design them. The first one is variables. So we have a, two different types of variables. The first one is the dependent variable, and that's what we're measuring. So if I'm doing a study to try to see how long does it take students to do a task using two different approaches, that amount of time is the dependent variable. It's what I'm measuring. It's what I'm trying to, to compare the things with. And then on the other hand, we have our independent variables, sometimes called treatment variables, and that's the thing that we're changing. So in that example I gave you, if I have two different ways to do an assignment, uh, and I'm trying to see which one helps students complete it quicker, the independent variable would be which way are they doing the assignment. The dependent variable would be how long does it take them to do it. Now within independent variables, we have some different types. We have controlled independent variables. So that example I just gave you is a controlled variable. I'm able to control which approach somebody uses. But we also have things that are uncontrolled. So for example, the knowledge and the background that the student walks into the classroom with. That can highly affect my study, but it's not something I can control. I can measure it, I can take it into account when I analyze it, but I can't control it. So we call it an uncontrolled independent variable. The next factor that's important are the data types. 
So some of this may be familiar to you, but we really have two main classes of data. We have quantitative data, which are typically thought of as the numbers, and we have qualitative data, which are not the numbers. So they're the words, the pictures, the observations, the descriptions. If we think about quantitative data, those tend to be more controlled measures. So I know what I'm measuring. I'm measuring time. I'm measuring how many answers are correct, et cetera. They tend to be more objective. They don't have to be. I can come up with a subjective quantitative question. I can ask you on a scale of one to five, what, how do you feel today? That's subjective, but it's quantitative. But in general, quantitative data is more objective and it's verification oriented. So I'm tending to use this to say, I have a hypothesis. I want to run a test. I want to run a study to see whether that hypothesis is supported or not. Conversely, we have qualitative data. So this data is more naturalistic and uncontrolled. So if I'm doing an observation or an interview, I, I'm not sure what somebody's going to tell me. I'm not sure what they're going to do. So I, I don't know in advance what data I'm going to get. Similar to how quantitative data is more objective, qualitative data tends to be subjective. Again, you can come up with examples of objective qualitative data, but in general, it's more subjective. And rather trying than trying to verify a hypothesis, with qualitative data, we're often doing discovery. We don't have a good hypothesis. We don't have a good understanding yet. So we need to do some qualitative analysis to get an understanding to help us then pose some more quantitative type studies later on. So if we compare these two types of research side by side, we can see things like the focus. So if I look at qualitative research, the focus is really on people in their natural settings. Um, we're looking at in-depth data. So usually with a qualitative study, you're getting a lot of data, but about a smaller number of people. Uh, the settings in which you can do qualitative research are much more limited because of the level of in-depth information that you have to get. And the conclusions that you draw are typically interpretations that the researcher makes based upon all this qualitative data that they receive. On the other hand, with quantitative research, we're actually tended to be looking more at specific behaviors that we can quantify, like some of the examples I gave before. The data here is less detailed, so we're not getting as much detail, we're getting more specific information, but it's about a larger group of people. So we can get less information about more people in quantitative research. And the kind of conclusions here tend to come from statistical data analysis because of the type of data that we're collecting. So these two both have their place. They have different areas of focus and they have different emphases. And a lot of times you may use them both in the same study. Another thing that we need to think about are some of the contextual factors that might affect the decisions that we're going to make as we design our study. So as we think about the context, some of the questions we want to consider is who? Who's participating? Who's teaching the course? Who are the students? Uh, how long do I have them? Is it one assignment? Is it one class period? Is it a whole semester? Is it a whole program? Um, and how many? Do I have a small number of subjects that I can get lots of data about? Or do I, I want to look at a really large population and I really only can collect a small piece of information about each one? These factors all affect how we go forward with our study designs. Okay, so the second part of this presentation, I want to walk through some of the specific types of study designs. This is a basic introduction. There's some lot more complex things that we can talk about in the context of individual studies, but this should hopefully give you a foundation. In terms of types of studies, we have two different types of studies that we're going to think about. First, those that are descriptive, meaning we don't really try to make a change, um, but we're really just trying to describe what's going on. So those a lot of times happen through case study, observation, interview, focus groups, things like that. And the other kind of studies are evaluative. And these are things where we're trying to actually draw some stronger conclusions. And these can be experimental or quasi-experimental. And I'll talk in a minute about the difference between those two. And so some of the basic designs. So the first most simple design is a single group post-test only design. And so let me explain some of this terminology and explain the figure and the rest of them will, will use the same approach. So we have a group of subjects, take this to be maybe students in our class, and we wanna have them do something. So we're gonna introduce the independent variable. Maybe this is a new way that I'm gonna teach a concept in class. And then I'm gonna measure the effect. So I have some way that I'm gonna measure this. Maybe, maybe I'm gonna do an exam question, for example. So I want to teach them in the new way and then see how they do on the exam. So this is a good basic study, but the big problem here is I don't know anything about the participants. So all I have is my measurement afterwards. I don't have anything to tell me how they performed before. So that's when I can go to a slightly more complex design, which is still a single group pretest, post-test design. So now you can see I've introduced a pretest before the treatment. 
before the experimental variable. So this gives me a chance to measure something about the participants before and measure something after so I can see if there actually is a change in what's going on. So why do we use a pretest? I've kind of already given you some of those answers, but if you want to think about that on your own, this would be a good time to pause the video for just a minute and think about how you would answer that question and then come back and we'll go through it. Okay, so why do we use a pretest? Well, one example is if I have a small sample, a small number of people, I really do need to know something about them beforehand because the smaller the sample, the more impact one person can have on the results. So this allows me to measure the change in individuals because I know something about you beforehand and I know something about you afterwards. Um, and in cases where I'm doing multiple groups, which I'll talk about here in a second, it affects the, assesses the effects of mortality. And when I say mortality, we're not killing people, hopefully, but we're looking at people who don't complete our study. So I want to know if I have multiple groups, if somebody drops out, what effect did that have on my sample? Did, did I completely bias my results because of who dropped out or not? If I don't have a pretest, I don't know anything about that. Some of the disadvantages, well, they're time consuming because I have to add another step in the front of the process. And so that's gonna cause me to have to do something more and the students are gonna have to do something more. But more importantly, pretests can affect behavior. So I really have to be careful if I give somebody a pretest, is that going to change how they might do the treatment? Have I changed the person? Have I introduced bias there? And that's a really important concept because hopefully what I'm trying to measure is how people would behave without being biased. So I have to be really careful what I do in a pretest. Okay, so this is a little bit more complex design than the example with no pretest, but we still have a problem here. I still don't know, even if I see a change from my pretest to my post test, I don't know if anything else happened in the middle besides my treatment that could have caused that. Maybe the students all learned something in another class and all of a sudden they all got better and, and I wasn't prepared for that. So in order to have some better insight, I need to add another group. So I have a two group design now, and I'm going to start with the simple one, the post test only. I have my subjects again, but I need to obtain two groups. So somehow I'm going to split these into two groups. And now I have those that are going to get my treatment variable. So they're going to get my new approach to teaching and those that are going to get my control variable. They're going to get the typical way, or I could even introduce a second treatment if I wanted to compare two ways to teach. But now I've got two groups. They're going to get different things then I'm gonna measure that effect on both of them and I can do the same thing. I can now compare the dependent variable and see, is there a difference between the treatment group and the control group? So this is better, I have a comparison. I can, I can say um, with more confidence if I see a difference that probably the treatment variable did something, but I still have that problem with no pretest that I mentioned on the first version. So I can make this more complex and throw a pretest in there. And now what this lets me do is it lets me see, is there actually a change um, that's different for the experimental group than there is for the control group. So that accounts for that example I said, if, some, if all the students in another class learn something that makes them all better, um, then I should see that improvement in both groups. But if I still see a bigger improvement in the experimental group, I have a better basis to decide that that actually had the effect that I thought it had. So these are not simple, they, they continue to get more and more complex. And we could even think about this question of experiment versus quasi-experiment I mentioned before. So in an experiment, which I've kind of begun talking about, the researcher manipulates whatever that independent variable is to create groups with different levels. So it could be a, a control group and a treatment group. It could be two different treatment groups, but you have different groups with different levels of the variable. And then I'm going to compare the groups based on the dependent variable, like I was just showing you. But the idea here is an experiment, I need to try to keep everything else constant because otherwise those other variables could affect my results. So there's a couple of different ways that I can do this. One is by control. So I can control who gets put in each group so that I can try to make sure that other variables don't affect it. Or the better way to do that when I have a large enough group is randomization. So I randomly put people in each group. And by doing randomization over a large enough sample, any of those other variables that I don't even know are potentially relevant, those kind of get washed out because they get put into both groups. So this idea of internal validity that we're gonna talk more about when we think about threats to validity, but this idea is that a researcher has to design a study so that only the independent variable is the one that could cause the results. So I want to eliminate as many possible alternate explanations for my results. And the more that I can eliminate, the more confidence I can have that that independent variable, that change that I made really did cause the results.
Um, the other thing that I'll say here is the difference between experiments and quasi experiments. So if I, if I don't have the ability to randomize or control, then I don't have an experiment. I have a quasi experiment. That doesn't mean that it's, it's not valuable. It just means I have more threats to validity because I didn't control the population. So let me give you an example. If I, if I have two sections of a course and I want to run a study where I see I'm going to do one section one way and another section another way. That's not an experiment because the students were not randomly assigned to the sections. They are already grouped in those sections in some way. So it's a quasi experiment. Now, if I have people all in one section and I randomly put them in groups, then that would be an experiment. So regardless of whether I'm doing quasi experiments or regular true experiments, I have to think about how to assign subjects to groups. And there's two different ways that I can do this. I can have independent groups, which means if I have a treatment and a control, I have different people in each one. So some people get the treatment approach, some people get the control approach. And I, if I'm doing an experiment, I do that assignment randomly. If I'm doing a quasi experiment, it's not done randomly. The other approach is that I have repeated measures. And what that means is that each person participates in both groups. So if it's possible, I have each person do both the control and the treatment, as opposed to having different people in each group. So the advantages to this repeated measures approach is that number one, I need fewer participants because I have people in each group instead of having to have two different sets of people. But also the statistical sensitivity because each person is acting as their own control. So I can do a different kind of statistical analysis when I have repeated measures and I know that it's the same people in both groups. The disadvantages, one is similar to what I just said about the pretest, is what we call order effects. And that is, it, does the order in which they do the activities actually have an effect? So by doing the activity one way, does that change how I do it when I get it the second time? So am I a better or a different person? And if so, then repeated measures may not be possible. So for example, if I'm going from kind of an unstructured ad hoc way to do something, and then I'm teaching you a more structured way to do something, well, I can't, I can't do those in the other order. I can't say, do it in this structured ordered way. Okay, now forget the structured and go back and do it in an unstructured ad hoc way. I can't do that. So there's some cases where repeated measures aren't even possible. But when they are possible, we do have to worry about the order effects and the counterbalancing. So the idea of counterbalancing here is that I wanna have all the different possible orders. So instead of only having the top order where they do the experimental treatment then the control treatment, I may want to split my participants into two groups so they have both orders. So I have some do the experimental treatment first, some do the control treatment first, and then I can compare the dependent variable measured after the experimental treatment from both groups with the dependent variable measured after the control treatment from both groups and see if there's an effect. And if there was an order effect, hopefully I've eliminated by having the different orders. So with two variables, this is, the, this is the idea of counterbalancing. We have more than two, uh, two independent variables or more than two levels. So maybe I have three different ways to teach something. If I was going to do complete counterbalancing, this ordering gets very large very quickly because I would need to have all different possible orderings. And if that's something that's going to affect you, we can talk more about that um, separately because there are ways to, to reduce the number of orders. There's something called a Latin square approach, and we can talk more about that if you get into that complex design. Again, positives and negatives. The positives are I've eliminated or reduced the chances of the order effect. The negatives are the more levels of the variable I get, the more orders I have to have, and the more complex my design, and the harder it is for me to manage it. Okay, so after that kind of brief introduction, let me talk a little bit about threats to validity that we have to think about. This idea of threats to validity is any factor besides what I think I'm studying that actually could provide an alternate explanation for the observed measures. So if somebody reading my results or talking to me about my results can, can argue with me and say, I don't think you got the result because of why you think you got the result. Here's another reason why that could happen. Those are threats to validity. So let me give you an example. Section one of a course uses a new approach for learning a concept. Section two uses the current approach. The students in section one score better on the exam questions than the students in section two. So there's a really simple example. And the question we wanna ask is, does this result show that the new approach is beneficial? And the answer is maybe. There's some potential other explanations here. So this would be a good time for you to pause the video for just a minute and think about what other explanations could you give for this result that I obtained. 
Okay, so let me give you some of the things that I thought about as uh, alternate explanations. So what if the people in section one were just more experienced? So suppose section two conflicted with the time of another course that most of our really strong students were taking, so they had to take section one. That could be an explanation. Uh, what about if we have different instructors and the instructor of section one does a, just does a better job of teaching and it has nothing to do with the approach, it's just a better instructor. That's another alternate explanation. And you could come up with lots of other ones, but the idea here with threats of validity is I want to think about these potential alternate explanations on the front end so that I can adjust my study design so that I can eliminate or reduce as many of them as possible so that when I draw my conclusions at the end, I've got a stronger argument for my result. Okay, so this idea of eliminating alternative explanations really does increase the value and the validity of our study. Sometimes you might hear the term confounding variables as a description for something else that could have caused your result, uh, and, that, and that's just a, another term for the same thing. There's really three types of validity threats that we want to expose you to. The first one is internal validity threats, and that's everything I've been talking about thus far are really internal validity threats. And internal validity threats are ones that answer the question, are the conclusions valid? So those things I gave on the last slide were internal validity threats. The, the, the subjects in the two samples were different. The instructor was different, et cetera. We also have to worry about construct validity threats. And so construct validity answers the question, are the specific measures that I used valid? So for example, if in the previous study, I used an exam question to measure learning, a construct validity threat would say, well, an exam question is really not the best way to measure learning. So I, I might have a construct validity problem. I might have to think about, is there a better way to measure that outcome that I care about? And then the last one is external validity threats. And that says, maybe I have a really internally valid study, my constructs were good, but does this result apply beyond the small set of people I happen to have in the sample? So that's an external validity threat. Can the conclusions be generalized? You may see other types of validity threats, but they generally fall into these categories. So once I've thought about my study design, one thing that I do want to think about using is a pilot study. So a pilot study is something that I'm going to use to test the validity of the study design. So I'm not testing my hypothesis, I'm testing the design itself. And so this is my chance to identify any problems before I run the full study. Because you don't want to have the case where you, you get your subjects, you get your class, you get your students, you do something, you get to the end and you realize that you made a serious mistake. You collected the wrong data, you answered the wrong question something didn't work right and you've wasted that whole experience. So the pilot study is a chance for you to debug that on the front end. And one important thing to remember from a pilot study is you're testing the study design. So any data that you collect, you should not include that in your final analysis. The, the point of the pilot study is to test out the study. It's not to collect data. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop here. There are some more complex study designs that we can get into in your particular situations, and we'd be happy to talk about those in more detail. Thank you.